So, very good morning to all. 
I think it is exactly 10 o'clock. So normally in CII, we usually start exactly on time. So I would like to keep the protocol and I would also like to start uh, uh, on time so that we have more time for uh, the discussions. So to start with, a very good morning to all of you. And on behalf of uh, CII, Gujarat, and on personal behalf, I extend a warm welcome to you at this virtual seminar on engineering precision, demolition of Noida Twin Tower, and air quality measures during the construction and demolition. First of all, I would like to thank the Indian Green Building Council and the Gujarat Institute of Civil Engineers and Architects for their support for this seminar. You all must be aware that infrastructure is the backbone of economic development. In cities and suburbs, construction of new buildings is an enduring process. Unquestionably, building of infrastructure is an essential step towards modernization, but it also brings with it numerous problems. And one of the most fun are related to pollution. The construction sector contributes to 23% of air pollution, 50% of climate change, 40% of water pollution, 50% of landfill waste. And we know that every structure is designed for a specific life period, maybe 50 years or 100 years or something like that. And existence of this structure after the service life period is very dangerous to its occupants and the surrounding buildings. Therefore, it becomes essential to demolish the building. Not only this, also many a times we have to demolish the buildings because of various other reasons. So demolition definitely contributes to air pollution. Demolition can lead to excessive dust, noise, smoke, and odor. Residents living near areas where demolition have taken place run the risk of getting impacted by fugitive discharges like harmful gas leaks that were inadvertently caused by destruction. Demolition often causes huge plumes of smoke and thus that can adversely uh, impact the people suffering from respiratory, uh, respiratory diseases. We in this seminar have eminent experts who will be delivering on engineering precision and, and uh, air quality management. Uh, before I go to this, I would also like to say that, you know, we have heard about technology. We had a, heard about, we hear more about technology of building. Uh, building construction, dam construction, or road construction, and so many other things to talk about. But normally nobody talks about the technology in demolition. In the, the dust pollution is many a times controlled in a very conventional method. Uh, I have not seen that in Gujarat, but definitely in Chennai I have seen whenever there is a building under construction, they cover it with a thin uh, a net green color net so that the debris and other things will not fall and also it contains the smoke to a great extent. In China, what they do is when the, in, the, in the places where the construction is going on, they spray a water like mist so that the dust will not come up. And in addition to that, what they also do is that the, the green uh, net, they spread it uh, around the, all around the floor, all around the building, and then they spray water on top of that so that it will not uh, allow the dust to flow. So in this seminar, we have got eminent experts who will be delivering on engineering precision and air quality management, demolition techniques with the case study of demolition of Noida Twin Towers, which was all of us, we have seen in various YouTubes and social media, we have seen that. And this, uh, a case study on this will be delivered by Mr. Mohan Ramanathan, who is the Managing Director of Advanced Construction Technologies in Private Limited. Mohan has made an immense contribution to Indian industry. I should not say that Indian demolition industry, but you know he has involved in a lot of demolition activities in the past, including something in Gujarat. Probably he will talk about that. And uh, uh, he, will, uh, he will talk about this innovative technology where the, the huge building was demolished in a fraction of seconds. Uh, which is really unbelievable. I have seen a similar this thing in Cochin. One building was brought down. It is something similar to that. Then we also have Mr. Neeraj Shah, uh, Environmental Engineer, Gujarat Pollution Control Board, 
uh, government of Gujarat who will be delivering his address on air quality measures to be taken care during construction and demolition, wherein what are the techniques and measures that can be taken during the construction and demolition of buildings. I would also like to share that we have IGBC Ahmedabad Chapter Chairman and Managing Director of uh, Savi Group, Mr. Samir Sina, joining in as one of the key speakers, along with uh, Dr. Uh, Vatsal Patel, President, uh, President of uh, Gujarat Institute of Civil Engineers and Architects, uh, sharing his thoughts for the week, uh, thoughts, on, uh, thoughts and views. And um, uh, I hope and believe that today's seminar would be very fruitful and it paves ways for many more discussion on engineering precision and um, air quality measures during the construction and demolition. Uh, before I hand it over to Mr. Samir Sina of IGBC Ahmedabad chapter, I would like to give you a very brief introduction of uh, the speakers. I will not take much time and um, to start with, okay, let me introduce myself first. I am Anand Sundarishan. I am the convener of uh, CII Gujarat Panel on Infrastructure and Real Estate. And also the managing director of uh, managing director uh, India and executive as vice president of Aman Group. Uh, we are the manufacturers of road construction machine like asphalt plants, uh, compactors, pavers, uh, and all. Our company is a 150 year old company. Uh, we have our factory in Ditasan where we employ more than 1,500 people. Then we have Mr. Samir Sina, chairman of IGBC Ahmedabad chapter, and managing director of Savi Group. Mr. Sina holds an engineering degree from LD College of Engineering and has completed his MS in Civil Engineering from Prude University, USA. He worked on several multi-million dollar infrastructure projects in Chicago before establishing Savi Infrastructure along with his two colleagues and classmates in February 1996. Today, Savi has established a formidable reputation in real estate arena in Gujarat. It is known for its high-end commercial and residential development. Savi has built projects worth nearly uh, 1,000 crores, including 20 lakh square feet of residential and commercial development and 750 acres of Gulf Township since 1996. He is the chairman of IGBC Ahmedabad chapter and member of National Executive Committee of IGBC. He is uh, driving the green building movement in the city with great passion to restore the health of our ailing mother earth. Welcome, Mr. Sunam. Then we have Mr. Vatsal Patel, President of Gujarat Institute of Civil Engineers and Architect. Dr. Vatsal Patel is an engineer, urban planner with over 29 years of academic and professional experience in structural engineering and urban planning. He holds academic degree in engineering, urban planning, law and management. Dr. Patel started his career with the structural engineering firm where he reached the position of senior structural designer and was uh, responsible for structural designs of various hotels, factories, commercial institutions, and industrial buildings. During this period, he also gained additional competence as independent structural design. Since last 26 years, Dr. Patel has worked with Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, joining as a town planning inspector, where he took uh, VRS. He was the head of the department of town development department of uh, AMC and uh, holding the post of city chief planner. He was holding the post of general manager planning and development in um, uh, SRBCL after VRS. At present, he is working as technical consultant in Gujarat RERA. Very welcome, Dr. Vatsal Patel. Then we have Mohan Ramanathan, Managing Director of Advanced Construction Technologies Private Limited. Mohan Ramanathan is the founder director of ACT Group of Companies. Mohan is also the managing director of Advanced Construction Technologies Private Limited. He has over 40 years of experience in the various fields of civil engineering, such as pile foundation, heavy earth moving equipment, demolition, concrete flooring, etc. His field of professional interest areas include pile foundation, demolition, recycling, heavy equipment, concrete technology, robotics, and construction. Mohan Rajanathan is a B.Tech in civil engineering from IIT Madras and a master from UIUC USA 1978 batch. He is also an active member of, in several professional societies like DFI, IGS, Institute of Engineers, ACCE, ICI, and IDA. He is constantly involved in transfer of technologies into India from developed countries. He was recently awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by ICA Chennai Chapter for 2021. Mohan Ramanathan has written a lot of papers 
if i start reading that i think you know this whole one and a half hours time will go away so i will restrict myself to this so welcome mohan mohan incidentally he is in uh, us uh, today he was on a holiday on my personal request uh, he has uh, agreed to you know present this case study for us so i thank you mohan for uh, joining us and welcome for this uh, seminar which i think will give us a lot of insight in uh, the demolition technology then we have mr neeraj shah environment engineer gujarat pollution control board gpcb government of gujarat mr neeraj shah holds masters in environmental engineering from ms university of baroda mr shah after having worked as a lecturer in engineering college of ms university of baroda in civil engineering department joined gpcb in 1996 out of the 26 years of service at gpcb mr shah worked for about 23 years in various regional offices of gpcb Mr. Shah has worked almost 23 years in industrial area like Baruch, Ankleshwar, Vadodara, with diverse and huge chemical activities. Mr. Shah was instrumental in preparing and implementing various action plans for CEPI, non-attainment city, polluted river stretch, groundwater remediation, etc. Recently, he was transferred to head office of GPCB at Gandhinagar and is heading hazardous waste branch in addition to other important portfolio. including national clean air program for non attainment city of gujarat um, so i welcome mr neeraj shah thank you very much so i welcome you for this seminar now i would uh, like to hand uh, to invite mr samir sinha igbc amdavad chapter chairman and managing director of sari group to deliver his address before i physically hand it over my only request is we have only 90 minutes and we have very good topics for Uh, uh, to learn. Besides that, we would also like to give some time to the people for asking some few questions. So I would rest, uh, request everybody to restrict their uh, address to the time that is provided to them. Thank you very much, and over to Mr. Sami Sinha. Thank you, Anand. Uh, such a pleasure to be with all of you on behalf of the Indian Green Building Council. Uh, we are delighted to be part of this seminar and to be able to lead this uh, a very important topic. Uh, before we begin i would uh, like to give, like to extend my personal welcome and gratitude to uh, all my uh, to anand of course to you uh, to dr vatsal patel my dear friend uh, also to mr neeraj shah from uh, gpcb uh, and really thanks a lot to mohan for uh, joining us from uh, all the way from the us and especially all the thanks to himanshu uh, for arranging and putting this very important topic together thank you guys uh, indian green building council uh, as some of you might be aware has been leading the sustainable development movement for real estate in the country for the last uh, several decades and we are very very proud to uh, to say that we are uh, one of the global leaders in terms of green footprint in the world uh, we are at about 9.7 billion square feet and we hope to become the global leader uh, in the next few years uh, this has been driven purely by the passion uh, and the commitment of uh, all the all participants of the real estate industry whether it be consultants developers designers architects uh, or whatever we say um an igbc has been continuously moving uh, towards providing awareness and tools to facilitate the adoption of green and healthy buildings unfortunately uh, most of the development that happens uh, happens in our cities the gdp of the country resides in the city and that is where most of the development happens and uh, unfortunately that is where we have the biggest problems uh, 40% of all all pollution like anand said is created by the by the development of buildings in the industry uh, real estate industry and the air quality in our cities uh, suffer as a as a consequence of that and because most of the population lives there that becomes a very very critical issue for us to solve the other challenge that we will face as we move on is that the cities are the ones that will keep getting redeveloped and demolition of existing buildings will become a very important factor and if we cannot control that uh, we will we are we are headed for trouble we already have too many issues to solve uh, besides creating new problems of uh, demolishing existing buildings and and dealing with the waste and the pollution that we create from that so we are this is a very very important issue that we must tackle it's a new problem that we have created for ourselves but if you really want to make our cities more livable if you really want to uh, make our cities healthy if you want to give comfort and uh, better living conditions to the residents we must develop compact walkable uh, uh, livable cities 
which will mean a lot of redevelopment of existing cities. And every, every major country in the world uh, has done this. I have gone through that. And we must develop the right technologies and we must learn from the best. That is the effort for this seminar. And we are very delighted to have uh, Mohan uh, and Anand here with us to give us uh, uh, some ideas and, and teach us about what is the right way of demolishing and developing new buildings. Uh, this, the building that we just saw in Noida uh, getting demolished was a wonderful example of how things can be done well in a controlled fashion, in a safe way, and without causing any major impact uh, to the residents, to the neighbors, and to the environment. So with that, like Anand said, we will keep it very short and sweet because we really want to listen to the experts. Uh, so once again, thank you all of you for joining us. Thank you for the time, sparing the time. And we'll get back, to, uh, Anand, to you to lead us on the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samir Sunam. Um, as I rightly said, I have only one of course, as you rightly mentioned, you know, demolition is inevitable. So we have to control it for the benefit of all the residents and to bring down the, to, to make the air quality. Rim. One small point, since you are from ICPC, I wanted to mention to you, you know, whenever we are doing the building construction, unfortunately, the architects never tell us that, you know, why don't you make the building green? I'm very sorry to say that, but that's a fact. And... Uh, because I, I personally feel that it doesn't really cost too much to make a building green. Maybe it takes about 10% uh, more than the normal construction, but uh, over, over a period of time, I think it works out. Maybe we can discuss about it later, but I just want give me, to... Give me, uh, Anand, it's a very important yeah. topic you've touched upon. It's called for a whole different debate, and we will not get into that right now. But let me assure you one correction that I just want to make, which is very, very important for us to understand. Green buildings do not cost more. This 10% exactly. is a misconception. Oh. Please um, understand, green buildings are actually cheaper, not only to build, but to operate. But we'll get into that later. Uh, very so, important yes. topic, but so sure, Mr. Right. Sina, I think we will do a separate seminar on green building. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sina. And now I hand over to Dr. Vatsal Patel to, for his address. Thank you. You're on mute, uh, Dr. Vatsal Patel. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anand. Thank you, Samir. Uh, thank you, CII, for organizing such an important seminar, which is the need of today. Particularly, Gujarat Institute of Civil Engineers and Architects is the association of the kind where the civil engineers and architects both together, the first association because we are uh, celebrating our 75th year of establishment this year. And during this 75th year celebrations, we had lots of uh, seminars, workshops on technical things, as well as some of the seminar is really concerned with the environment, as well as the water conservations, as well as green cities and uh, uh, reducing the pollutions in the city. Uh, we also train lots of engineers, particularly for making such type of uh, efforts during their practice. Uh, one thing is very important is demolition we cannot avoid nowadays because we already entering into the 75th year of our independence. And as far as the concrete technology is concerned, it is uh, almost more than 75 years old technology. So do, do that uh, means the new buildings which was constructed before 50 years is now required to be demolished or we have to reconstruct it. And lots of, in, as far as real estate is concerned, lots of cities has uh, redevelopment policies. And because of these redevelopment policies, lots of buildings are under demolitions. Even today also, lots of buildings are under demolitions, which is uh, already going on. And really, it is concern for the city and the neighbors, as well as for the city government and the government also, as far as the pollution is concerned. Uh, everything, noise pollution, air pollution, uh, so many times even traffic congestion because of demolitions, uh, lots of things uh, is really disturbing all around the particular site. Uh, with this uh, concern, I believe that uh, this seminar will be very much helpful to the viewers, to us all, 
uh, and it will give the special insight to what type of uh, measures is genuinely required and how we can manage it. And particularly Neeracha from our uh, state level monitoring organization is also joining us. So that will also incite us for uh, what type of government measures uh, required and what type of actual uh, legal uh, provisions for making all these things possible. So thank you very much and I welcome you all uh, on the seminar. Thank you. Over to Anand. Uh, you are mute, Miss Anand, you are mute. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Vathil uh, Patel. I think you also should be present for the next seminar, what we'll have with Mr. Samir Sinam on uh, green building technology. Yes, of course. Because you have all the architects with you. Yes. So I think that will really help us. And, actually, uh, we actually you uh, that the pollution is a yeah. Big actually, concern. we want that uh, we can uh, organize such level or uh, such level training program for particularly architects. Yeah, it is the need. Right, that's true. Yeah, I agree. So now I hand it over to Mr. Mohan Ramanathan, who will talk on the subject of engineering position and uh, on demolition technique with the case study on. Uh, Demolition of Noida at Twin Towers. So over to you, Mohan. Thank you, Anand. I hope uh, I, my uh, screen is visible. Can somebody confirm? Can somebody visible, confirm? Visible. My, visible. Visible. Okay. So let me. Uh, I'm. I'm given thirty minutes to talk, uh, and I'll try to compress it as much as possible. Take only the relevant points relevant to today's talk. I wish to thank CII Gujarat chapter for uh, and Anand personally is a personal friend of mine, and also Mr. Neeraj Shah, uh, Mr. Samir Sinha, Mr. Vatsal Patel. Uh, all of you have uh, given a wonderful introduction to this talk, and um, I, I made this. Uh, this is my fifth presentation after the blast on August 28th. It's a topic of uh, great interest to everybody. And uh, I covered the engineering aspects is what I, my interest is to sh share the engineering aspects. And I will cover a little bit about how we handle the pollution. Uh, and i am also added a few slides uh, of two case studies, two small case studies, especially for this talk. One is on an ongoing uh, construction on a very, very prominent site in India, how we are handling air pollution. And uh, just a few slides on that. And also a new technique, which I have developed for implosions, which uh, I'm going to put it to trial uh, very soon uh, in India. So with this, uh, let me move ahead. So uh, I, uh, one slide about what my company does. As you see, uh, demolition cannot be a full profession. I, I run a company with all these brand names. So you see our, our partners. We sell and service this equipment in various served segments, as you can see, mostly in South India, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, and all these, uh, uh, these are trading business. We also have a business in uh, decorative concrete manufacturing. Um, so this is just our uh, introduction. Now the, the main part of the seminar is uh, the outline. Uh, all of you must have seen, I think most of India was watching on 28th of August uh, at 2.30, um, uh, when the implosion happened, it was well covered by all the media. So there's a fact file, which uh, I will skip for this, uh, uh, why and what led to this demolition. Uh, that's the story behind storyboard behind the implosion and why this method was chosen against so many other methods. And what's the engineering behind the scene? Uh, is it just by chance we get it so uh, highly precise? And the risk identification and mitigation. Since the, such a job has now been done in India, we only can imagine all the risks and uh, that would be part of uh, the. It could be it could, any one of the risks could be a problem, and we try to mitigate it much before it happens. Then the most important aspect is the blast design and the test blast itself. Uh, I will not dwell more, much much into this, but I wanted to just tell you there is a very precise engineering design behind the blast, which we call blast design. Environmental factors and mitigation, it's important to today's seminar. I will dwell a little bit more time on this. And how do we prepare the structure 
for the implosion to mitigate most of the things that we will discuss earlier. And on the D-Day, on the blast day, uh, what are the most critical activities involved? The data collection during and after blast. We took this opportunity to take uh, to collect as much data as possible. Uh, we had agencies to do it, and we are, and we are still processing some of the data. At some point of time, we will publish them. And uh, my own critical analysis of the blast performance. Uh, you will see how much marks I get. And right now, the demolition is uh, the contract is still not closed. The secondary demolition and debris handling is happening. Recycling of debris and cleanup. This is a very uh, hot topic in India. Recycling and reuse. And finally, uh, what are the lessons learned from this uh, nine-second implosion? Um, so the the fact file. I'm not going to dwell much much more on this. Here you can see on the right side. These are the two towers uh, which were demolished. At, uh, or you can say one is an uh, one is like an egg. The other is like a stretched egg. These are the two towers. This tower was uh, 103 meters. This is slightly two, two floors less. Uh, they have their names. But the point is, these is surrounded by sensitive uh, structures. This structure, 15 stories high, was only nine meters away. Uh, there is a gas pipeline belonging to the Gale, a live pressurized gas pipeline running uh, six meters away from the building. There is a green belt, dedicated green belt, and there is a structure quite close, an, uh, uh, another tower blocks. There's a, a highway right here and a power line. And this is surrounded by almost 15 buildings of 15 stories high. Uh, the total built up area is about 7.5 lakh square feet between these two towers. And the towers were stopped uh, due to a court order. I will not dwell much on that. So it's basically we have uh, in in uh, the work was stopped in 2014, and uh, you know it was brought down only this year. So so many years it was idle. All the construction was abruptly stopped, and uh, 28 uh, 94 meters was one one smaller building, and 103 meters was the taller building, which had 32 floors and a tower crane and everything uh, in place. Construction going full swing, but stopped. And it stopped from 2014 till 2022. It was a judicial decision. Supreme Court order was to blast, the, was to demolish the building. The order was placed on the Noida authorities, the government authorities, just like Maradu in, in Cochin, where five buildings were demolished due to Supreme Court order, uh, due to the gross violation of the building rules. This was also a similar case. But here, Supreme Court, in that voluminous document, took into account a lot of engineering aspects. And they also said CBRI, the government wing of the Central Building Research Institute of CSAR, can be the ORC, can oversee this, uh, the preparation, design, and the demolition. Uh, if they don't have the competence, they can use anybody they want. Uh, so that's why I got in the, into the picture. I was roped in. Uh, both uh, NOIDA and uh, Edifice, uh, the appointed contractor, and CBRI approved my involvement in complete proof checking of the entire process of six months' work. So the right side are the, P are the people, are the, are, the, are the organizations involved, CBRI, Supreme Court of India, Edifice Engineering, the nominated contractor, and Jet Demolition from South Africa, who are the blasting experts in this field. As in any project, we do a due diligence of all the methods. What are the right methods? What is pros and cons, cost? Uh, in any demolition, we have to look at the cost, time, and safety. These are the three most important vectors which we have to consider. Uh, Supreme Court placed an order that you have to do this job in four months. They've even fixed the date uh, in the first order. And uh, uh, considering many other, many factors, we chose the last one, which is the implosion and disposal of debris. Even that, the time frame uh, was uh, was estimated to be five months, one month more. But you know, we can always approach the court and get an extension. That was the strategy. All the other methods uh, where uh, uh, the cost risk analysis was done, 
cost benefit analysis and and the the law the implosion method was the one that finally decided and uh, i will not go into this uh, only thing i have to say is any any job can be done by any method there is no fixed job to the fixed uh, to a structure you have to look at the cost uh, risk and and the time aspects uh, so if this is analyzed and you can come about uh, based on the owner the owner what he decides if he fixes safety as the most important he may have to pay more or spend more time and so forth so this is the last method in this slide is implosion using explosives is the it was chosen and those of you who may not know uh, is we attack the columns only in this method we attack uh, approximately 60% of the columns are attacked and uh, we may go on alternate floors and a multi story building like this so there was this method has never been adopted for such tall building in india uh, uh, of over 100 meters this is the first time ever in india and um, and it's amongst the top 13 buildings in the world that have been brought down by implosion um, so why chosen the key the key uh, pointers are edifice and uh, jet demolition have an impeccable record of failures in this method there is no second chance uh, if you google and see implosions that have failed there are plenty of them in the internet so we don't have a second chance if something goes wrong the successful demolition of maradu buildings in kochi the five buildings in kochi gave us the confidence and this superstructure is really strong heavy we need lots of weight and we need gravity we cannot do in short buildings so this was ideally placed the supreme court order said four months so no way we can do other methods in in this kind of time frame and we have design capabilities in all stages whether we whether we whether we check whether do we have the designs to check the existing building to do the blast design and control everything and we were our own uh, you know we we did not have an external agency to monitor uh, to to proof check i i did most of the proof checking proof checking is important and extremely fast safe and economical when i say safe yes using explosives may be may trigger unsafe uh, and when it falls into the wrong hands but if done safely this is the safest method we had confidence on this method to do within the time frame environmental factors usually in this kind of demolitions are dust noise and vibrations you will see how how intently we have monitored all these all these three parameters a risk of flying debris which is like a missile or a gunshot can really be uh, if you're not taken care of can lead to accidents so the blast design the blast design itself is uh, it uh, to make it short it's like our, our firecrackers during diwali so the more uh, amount of uh, powder we put uh, into it and pack it so tightly you have more energy is very similar to that so if we want to blast one cubic meter of reinforced concrete then what we know is uh, the factor that we have to look at is the powder factor the powder factor is the amount in the energy in joules that's required to blast one cubic meter of concrete of a certain grade so i uh, just i just put the formula for academic reasons the the uh, by thumb rules and by experience we lell, we and also with the experience of the type of explosives we calculate the amount of uh, explosives required to shatter the concrete in a particular column so this is a very simple way of putting it but there's a lot more to that the figure on the right side you see so we had if you take a typical uh, building of uh, uh, this 33 floors we have the dark black lines are the blast floors in this i mean we blast every column in that floor uh, and in the and the in between there are floors which we don't blast also and there are floors which blast partially it's not just columns this building had enormous amount of shear walls in fact it's more shear walls than most of the buildings of this size it's super strong 
It was designed to assist a Zone 5 earthquake, even though NOIDA does not require it. Uh, it was designed to resist this kind of earthquake. So you can imagine the size of the columns and the heavy reinforcements involved. So the, the process is uh, we have to decide on the blast floors. We do a blast analysis and a collapse analysis. It's a proprietary program. We do a 3D analysis to show which direction to fall, which directions to fail, and where, what is the sequence of failure and so on. So we strip the entire flow, entire building was stripped with unnecessary loading. The partition walls, the sajas, the electrical plumbing, the floor finishes. Uh, mind you that uh, about 15 floors were ready for occupancy from the ground up. They were ready for occupancy with all the finishes in place. The upper floors where frames were up were going on. And the, so we had to strip uh, uh, all the finishes to reduce the weight and also to make sure that we do not have unnecessary uh, barriers to the free fall of the building. We had to decide on the particular way it will fall. So this, uh, this, uh, these drawings show you that we wanted to pull the building. These lines here showing this original blast design showing in seconds uh, of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, eight, seven, seven seconds was the original design to pull the building. This is how the blasting will take place along this line and along this line and along this line with a small delay of 200 to 300 seconds. As you go along, it reaches the seventh second on the last column, on the last row of columns on the rear end, the building would have started moving towards this direction. And this also happens in the vertical direction, uh, as you see here. So as you go up, the blasting happens. And as you go along the floor, also blasting happens. This is how it makes it to fall like a waterfall. Some of the TV news channels explained it as a waterfall method of falling. And uh, this uh, was what was designed for. And this dark area is the debris, extent of debris that was planned. We wanted to contain the debris within the footprint of the, of the plot an available uh, area and this is the gas line the pressurized gas line and we had to get uh, engineers india was gail's consultant to make sure that the the, the mitigation measures we have taken we are approved before the blast and uh, we had to prove many things to them and this is how the gale pipeline was protected with a steel plate and a earth berm i'll show some pictures and at the containers, uh, this is the building of 15 stories high, and we had to protect uh, the container, protect with uh, four, three layers of, of containers on one side. And there was an interconnecting slab. The basement was connected at both places between this building and this building. So we had to remove the entire connection of the basement's first basement slab completely. And we had to also buffer the raft because the client wanted the piles to be reused. So we did not do any blasting in the lower basement. There were two basements. We only blasted the uh, first basement and we did not put any charges to the second basement. So let me rush past the next one. And a lot of engineering analysis were done to, uh, to make sure that redundant structure, approximately, if you see this picture, the red ones are the, uh, uh, like for example, this, the shear, shear wall, have, this portion was asked to remove. This portion was removed. So this portion was removed in the lift well. So these portions leaves the building with, uh, with a lesser cross-sectional area to take the loads. Though it does not have any live loads, still it has to be stable in case there is an earthquake or in case there is a high wind. So we had to do analysis uh, of, uh, static and dynamic analysis to ensure the fiber stresses with the reduced sections is quite safe. This is a typical after breakouts, how the building stood and each floor, the stresses were checked and then only clearance given to do the, <clears throat> uh, do the reduction in the area. <clears throat> now, uh, prediction of ground vibrations. Ground vibration was a great concern. We had nearby buildings that were unsafe, or rather they were weak, which we felt they would be unsafe. We had pipeline, it was underground pipeline. 
And we had uh, consultants uh, from the nearby buildings uh, telling us that, uh, you know, our building is unsafe, so better strengthen up. Probably took a little bit advantage. So we did a full prediction of the particle velocity. The, the bottom most, bottom left table is a prediction. Based on, based on the soil parameters, the, the uh, prediction of the waves was 18 millimeters per second peak particle velocity, and the maximum likely is 27. And we went into the, a lot of international codes and formulae to convince uh, both Engineers India and the other authorities to make sure that we are not disturbing or making the nearby buildings in jeopardy. And all this is fine, or theoretically. So without the actual data, we are you know, go, uh, groping in the dark. So we did a test blast. So a test blast is usually done to make sure whether the formula of the powder factor we assume is correct. This is not a laboratory, so we have to do the an actual building or an actual column or chosen columns and monitor the vibrations. Here you see <clears> on <throat> the right side, the red ones are the uh, are the test plus columns in the basement one. And this is on the 13th floor, one column on the 13th floor. So this test blast was done with different charges for different floors just to see the effect and to see the ground vibrations. It is like a laboratory for us, but we did it on an actual build, on the actual building in an actual column. And uh, there's no really risk. Uh, our buildings are quite strong. They will, removal of one column will not affect. And this is the ground vibrations measured. This was done by IIT Madras and geostructurals from Cochin. They were uh, uh, put the geophones and accelerometers to measure, especially the gas pipeline was a great concern for us. So the points number one, two, and three were on the gas line. And you can see the peak particle velocities was not more than 2.2 millimeters per second. This is far less than what we need. But what we found was the charge K factor assumed was less. So it had, and the picture on the right is the blasted columns. This is, uh, we want the columns to be shattering like this and, uh, and the charge should be just sufficient to shatter the columns. Here we have cut off the steel. I took the one or two weeks later. And what really happened is it was a great learning that we have, we had to increase, if you see the, the table below, before and after the blast. Before the blast, the design was 8,300 holes to be drilled in the columns and lift well and, uh, and the shear walls. It almost increased by 19%. The total drilling meters was close to 17 kilometers of drilling. These are diamond core drill holes. The protection, protection is the we have chain link a six layer it was three layers it became six layers and the geotextile to hold the dust and the debris flying debris that also increased by 50 percent the blast force we increased the number of blast force from 18 to 21 both secondary and primary were increased the amount of explosives also increased by 36 percent and the time we needed was more to charge so this, all this, with all this data and the number of seconds, which was changed from seven to nine seconds. With this data, uh, the contractor approached for extension of time and uh, Supreme Court uh, heard us, uh, heard my expert opinion on this and uh, they allowed the extra time we needed and that's how the date was fixed. Now, risk mitigation and, 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 and risk identification and mitigation. This is very important. We have to identify all possible risks. Uh, risk to human beings, risk to animals, risk to nearby buildings and gas pipeline, uh, aircrafts, they should not be allowed to flow. You can think of uh, almost any operation like this. I actually compared it to the NASA or ISRO's blast off. Such precise operations we had to do. And uh, they at least have a chance to stop the countdown if they find something wrong, whereas we did not have that chance with all the cameras watching. So we, uh, you can imagine these are some of the sample sheets that were presented for disaster identification, uh, risk identification, mitigation, and they were all in place. 
and the red the red square here uh, the, is the exclusion zone we had a 250 meter exclusion zone that nobody nobody was there in this exclusion zone uh, um, when when the blast happened and we had we had the cooperation of the police the fire brigade the authorities and everybody was all eyes for us now this is important slide for you, for you because the dust mitigation the source of dust is the the blast column we had to protect it from six layers of chain chain link fencing and six layers of geotextile 500 gsm so this was supposed to contain the flying debris and the dust still uh, which emanates from here but the dust from the impact from the touchdown cannot be stopped uh, it it is a, it is a, one of the uh, let's say cons of this using this method and the vibrations were cut off using uh, an extremely intelligent design of the fall uh, the, the waterfall method there was no third impact plus we had trenches these are the berms in, on top of the on top of the uh, <laughs> gas pipeline we had some buffers of uh, tires here and of course we had standby uh, plenty of uh, fire engines and water tankers and from, uh, fog sprays everything were all in place so dust uh, was tackled by at the source uh, noise by mitigation of design of the fall and trenches air over pressure again controlled by the by the distribution of the distribution of the of the uh, charge uh, with the delays air pressure we bothered about the glasses breaking windows panes and uh, causing unnecessary discomfort to human beings and all of them were addressed and in spite of all that we had to take a third party insurance of 100 crores in case there was a damage to any of the nearby structures humans or so forth third party insurance was taken all emergency uh, services in plane plan and about 5000 residents were vacant, vacated for about 12 hours from 7 am to 7 pm on that day so these are all possibly the, the only things that we could do and it was done and a particular attention to how we protected the nearby buildings anand sundaresan mentioned about the green uh, green cloth yes we had plenty of them we had plenty of them like shrouds over all the all the entire surrounding all the buildings were shrouded with geotextiles uh, and uh, like this so that mainly the dust doesn't get into the air conditioners we asked all of them to switch off the air conditioners and close their windows and we were to go and replace any damage but the first layer of protection was we had these cloths hanging on all the buildings around and during the demolition process during the process we had these kind of a mist cannons working all around the building or where we are doing the preparation of the building by internal demolition of walls so these these dust mist cannons are uh, played a major role for six months uh, we had never had any complaints from and we didn't work in the night of course unavoidable sometimes now this is the kind of work that went on for six months uh, we had about the total volume is about 25000 cubic meters to be to be blasted down 9600 holes 17000 meters of drilling of 34 mm diamond core drilling we had to do a knockout when you say knockout we use this kind of uh, manual or using hydraulic excavators uh, to demolish the building and this kind of markings on the shear walls and columns 250 people working for six months, say 4,500 man days. So this is a mammoth work. And uh, uh, the last two, last one month, no power. So we had to, the people had to walk up all the floors to charge their holes. It's no mean task. So we had a, a huge amount of equipment working, ex mini excavators, hand chippers, ex breakers, skid steers, platforms, you can think uh, any this kind of job uh, being in any part of the world this would they would do it exactly the same way maybe it's a little bit less manpower 
we also had uh, this kind of a risky operation if you watch the the uh, people coming in uh, hanging and and fixing the fixing the uh, curtains and uh, imagine 100 meters they hang and do it we had experts to come and do it safety of primary concern i'm i'm happy to say touchwood so far we, we did not have a single accident and uh, this was uh, possible only because a highly disciplined workforce highly controlled and uh, well trained i will skip this so may not have been interest here we use totally 100% indian explosives they call them emulsion, emulsion explosives with uh, which are shock tubes so i will skip this i will not explain too much here we did the model analysis of the nearby building which was vulnerable and we found it is could be unsafe and it went for retrofit so it's a 12 15 story building uh, which was very close 9 meters away from the a full scale analysis 3d modeling was done and 3d modeling analysis was done and we found that it could become unsafe and it may collapse uh, so it went for strengthening at the cost of the contractor on the blast day we had uh, so many critical activities uh, evacuation of the residents uh, standby vip we had a vip gallery uh, some of the largest companies in india were invited and uh, they, they viewed from a distance and uh, i did the vip briefing what to expect what not to expect uh, a small puja was done uh and uh, and we had drones in the air we had atc stop the flying for one hour around that area uh, we had five drones including the thermal zones so on the blast day we have teams from various parts of the world uh, to come and witness this they were all our invitees and i did a puja uh, just without which we cannot have expect any success the south african partner was very keen that uh, he participated in our puja i will skip the video for a short of time all of you must have seen it i'm skipping the video now um, we collected a lot of data this is of engineering interest we would not let it go without the uh, collecting a lot of data on ground vibrations heat heat mapping and uh, uh, and aerial views and so on here yeah, we had it metras again and we had cbri put in black boxes uh, they had some special interest to in the in the building they had put black boxes which were recovered from the debris and still recovering from the debris and a lot of this vibration and we had high speed cameras which could not be destroyed we will view it later so we took this opportunity to uh, collect as much data as possible and uh, uh the ground vibrations uh, taken during the blast this is the data that uh, we said and with the nine we can clearly see nine second data the two peaks you can see one is the fall one is the blast the other is the uh here the the touchdown and they all within the limits uh, we had about 15 or 20 i think 20 and some of them got spoiled but you can see the peak particle velocity this is the important data it well within the parameter set uh, of 25 millimeters per second one inch per second so everybody was quite happy and the uh, pollution control board was involved in the air quality index measurement they've been measuring the air quality index few days before and and uh, the dust cloud which is inevitable it in 30 minutes the dust cloud vanished and uh, pollution control board also gave a, a NOC or a clearance um, for aircraft to fly and people to go back. I don't have that report with me, and, uh, but they uh, they gave us a clear, clear chit and uh, they said the air quality, we had the advantage that even the original air quality was not so great, even before the blast. So when we did spoil the air quality momentarily, this is a momentary in, uh, inconvenience, uh, uh, for half an hour and within 30 minutes um, it vanished due to the wind velocity we were monitoring the wind uh, wind direction and wind speed that day the wind direction completely changed 180 degrees it was a surprise for us now how do i assess this uh, this is my personal 
uh, assessment for the critical review of the performance vibrations within control, within noise, dust. These three are the environmental factors where we had no objections from anybody. The debris footprint, which was within the within the engineering parameters, there was slight, there was slight uh, failure in this line. I put a red circle here. My opinion, this should not have happened, but it didn't cause any damage. So the public never knew, the press did not know about it. But um, as engineers, uh, we could have done better. This is my in the, my final report. If you see the bottom right picture, this is a near miss. This is actually a near miss. If this, these are both the top three floors of the two buildings. I have a different, I have my own analysis of why it happened, but I'll skip it for now. But this is, I call as a near miss. So the, the collateral damage, we did not have much. Maybe there was a compound wall which got damaged. I think the total collateral damage was less than five lakhs. Uh, so it was not, an, not at all an issue monetarily. But engineering wise, I would think we would have done better, could have done better. The debris site was well, well within, so less than five meters, well within the predictable limit. Breakage at touchdown, yes, most of it is broken down. As you can see the drone picture, most of it is broken down. The flying debris, there's no report of flying debris or anybody got hurt. There is no report of undetonated charge. The gale line gave, gave, gale gave us a clearance that there was no pressure drop in 30 minutes. No damage to Aster 2, which is what we feared a lot, to pull the building down this direction so that this nine meter building is not damaged. Absolutely no damage. This was strengthened also. No damage to the ATS building. This is the ATS building, the other end of this. This is the building we pulled away. This is the building which could have been called, a, we can call it a near miss because this gap was only five meters. And this is uh, overall marks. I'm, I'm just saying if you're able, if I have to grade this performance, it's uh, 95%. Well, it's still for the general audience and the public, it was great. We all clapped on that moment. But uh, when I did the critical walkthrough, I knew there was something could have been better. So it could have been a near miss of the gas pipeline and the mitigation methods, it went, it actually fell on the gas line, as you can see here, but nothing happened because we took precautionary measures and we did, it worked. Right now, in Noida, right now, this is what is happening. Uh, enormous amount of debris being uh, removed, uh, steel being recycled. Uh, it's going to reach a melting, melting plant. Unfortunately, we do not have a uh, high capacity recycling, CND waste recycling plant in Noida. We have one which is uh, very small capacity and of course, whatever is possible is going there, but this is what we lack in India. We, we lack large CND plants which can take over from here. We don't have it. I'm trying to do my best to do this uh, in a better way. But let's wait and see. We estimate about <clears throat> 4,000 tons of steel to come for melting, and this is where the contractor's money is. All the money he has, they, they have spent, he, he has to end cash by selling the steel. And uh, the black boxes are still being recovered, and one day we may, uh, I may join hands with CBRI to write an article on this, on their findings. So this, uh, the, 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 the Indian scenario is after the blast today, the recycling people uh, are not there, to take care of the environmentally. Uh, so what we are doing now is downsizing and goes to landfill. That's a pity, but that's the reality. And the learning, we have, there are three instances that have happened. One is the Maradu, the other is the Mughaliwakam in 2016, and the Maradu in 2020 and 2022 now. All this, uh, shows that the law is supreme and law cannot be questioned. And I can read only one line that as a professional, it was a job to be done perfectly. And I don't hear the other narratives uh, which people throw at me. Uh, this could have been put to better use and, and so many things. You can talk from the outside. But uh, they need the job had to be done and it had to be done professionally and perfectly. Uh, so I, my job was a civil engineer. I think uh, I feel proud 
that we have resurrected the law in front of millions and uh, a billion people who watched it. And uh, that is why I called it engineering perfection. And, uh, but I see also feel sad that efforts of thousands of engineering uh, engineers and workmen who were put in the efforts had to be demolished in nine seconds. That's a sad part. So all their uh, efforts have gone to dust. So this is something that uh, in this case, which the building is brand new and not outlived its time, but there are so many other structures that are being uh, demolished today because it has outlived its function and that's why it needs uh, demolition. So I must thank uh, all these uh, all these people here uh, who have helped this job code uh, execute perfectly. And uh, without the help of so many, such a job using explosives in the middle of a metro cannot be done. I have a video here, which uh, again, I will skip. And uh, I just want to introduce uh, that I'm trying to do something different uh, in the case of implosion of chimneys. There are hundreds of chimneys in India that will have to go down. People are looking at implosion as an option. And uh, I'm uh, along with a company based in Mumbai, Leshla. Uh, they, we are working out a, a new system um, which, which can mitigate the dust coming out of a chimney implosion. So far, this has never been tried. We're going to try it in India pretty soon. I thought I will share this with you. This is called as a, a rain cloud. We have uh, the chimney falling down and when it impacts the ground, it will produce enormous amount of dust at high velocity. And we are trying to have a rain curtain instantaneously. As, uh, uh, and we hope at least 50% of the dust can be converted uh, can be brought down, can be captured. So this is something that that uh, uh, it is being worked out. The job is not done yet, and I hope to show this to uh, show this to you so that we are we have this technology capability within India, and we can do this uh, for the first time in the world. And uh, also, these are highly specialized in nozzles. Also, they, this seminar talked about dust control during construction. So here is the new parliament house building. It's a very high profile building and it's being, the construction is going on right now. And I got these uh, slides from the company that is doing the dust protection. Dust, uh, so dust coming out of a normal construction site, this site, uh, this company has uh, identified, Leshla has identified that to contain the dust within the zone, within the zone that's marked here. So they have used a very special dust fogging system, micro mist fog curtain. And uh, the, those of you who are interested, we can talk a little bit more about it. And the, 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 uh, the, the best part is they even set up their dust uh, spray from the tower cranes. I never seen this before, and I would like to show it to you. So this is the parliament house construction where the dust mist, the mist is a fog curtain is coming from the tower crane. So even in India, I think this is, this is not common, but we have the technology to prevent dust coming from construction sites. So this is an example just, just to show you that uh, we can prevent dust if there is an intent. Our eye, our eye quality index, one of the main, uh, uh, main, um, causes is during construction that uh, the dust generation is very high. So we can mitigate this if we are able to enforce and we are doing it. I've just brought up these two uh, examples of during construction and during demolition. Definitely we can look more into it. And if people up, you must be prepared to spend. The client owners look the other way, they're not ready to spend. That's what I think. And uh, this is the last slide where, uh, on my part, I have uh, formed an association called Indian Demolition Association. Our, um, we are having a second conference uh, next year. It's, uh, it's exhaustive for people who are interested should attend and uh, to register and attend. It's in Bangalore. The live demonstration, the world experts are coming in, in all sorts of field, including nuclear demolition, nuclear power, and, and recycling. So this is just an 
to take the lead because CII is, a, is an excellent platform and uh, the, the, the registrations and the sponsorships and are open. So uh, this is what we did. We changed the skyline of NOIDA uh, in, a, in nine seconds. Thank you very much. Thank I you. just uh, finished uh, the last slide. Thank I you, hope I've you. exceeded by about five, five minutes. Thanks a lot, uh, Anand and thank others. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. It was very interesting. Of course, I wouldn't uh, talk too much about it, but definitely it is a real engineering marvel. It's not, you know, you have explained us very nicely what goes behind such a precise uh, demolition. Uh, I definitely would like to see the video once again, uh, but I think that we can see it in the YouTube also. So probably we will yes. leave it to that because we are running out of time. And uh, now I call upon uh, Mr. Neeraj Shah, uh, Environmental Engineer, Gujarat Pollution Control Board, GPCB Government of Gujarat, to talk about the air quality measures to be taken care of during the construction and uh, demolition. Can I stop sharing mine? Yeah, please. Good morning. Good morning. Am I audible? Yes, very much. Yes. Uh, uh, my you, have to, you, you have to put your presentation in the presentation mode. Yeah. Uh, is it safe? It's is in the it's in the normal it? mode. If you can put it on the presentation mode. Presentation mode. Okay. Uh, before we put it on a presentation mode, my member secretary, uh, Thakar sir, is with me. So initially, he will have his five minutes of, uh, you know, his uh, view, and then I will follow with the presentation. Okay, fine. Escape. Escape. Okay. Escape. Escape. Screen cut. I mean, good morning, you all. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, CII, IGBC, uh, Dr. Samir Sinha, and all the, I mean, organizer of this uh, webinar uh, to touch upon this sensitive subject and uh, uh, to sensitize the, say, builders and uh, developers of uh, Gujarat uh, on the subjects. So first of all, congratulations from my side to uh, CII and all the organizations. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, theme uh, that touches upon, and uh, if you see the recent past of, say, Ahmedabad, I mean, there was a headline that uh, air quality index of the Bhopal area in Ahmedabad was even higher than the other industrialized area of uh, uh, Ahmedabad, okay? So that catches the attraction that the Bhopal is a, I mean, growing uh, area of an Amraba city and uh, I mean, it's a lots of large construction activity. And a major co contribution in that air quality index from the construction activity uh, only. And as a regulator, that's why it was a cause of our concern, I mean, to participate into this and uh, to sensitize the uh, builders and developers that uh, uh, it is uh, very important to control dust, particularly fugitive dust emission uh, from the construction activity. And uh, uh, that's why this presentation, my colleague will uh, go into the detailed technical nitty gritty of the subject. But uh, uh, what I understand that uh, solutions are simple. Only we need to have, say, a little mindset to implement this. Uh, if you see a regulatory regime for this, those projects which are, I mean, uh, having more than 20,000 square meter of a uh, construction area, they are falling into, say, regime of environment clearance under section uh, category 8A and 8B of the uh, EIA notification uh, schedule. But uh, 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 other projects, I mean, those who are not falling into this uh, EIA notification and environment clearance regime, we need to take cognizance uh, of this fugitive dust emissions because it affects the public at large. And uh, that's why if it is not controlled in a, say, uh, I mean, right manner, it may create, say, public uproar also from the vicinity. So uh, in EIA notifications and while giving the environment clearance, uh, uh, authority prescribes certain conditions that what measures you need to take uh, uh, control fugitive emission during constructions. Uh, and this should be implemented. 
But what we understand that only regulatory approach cannot work. I mean, one has to come with a voluntary uh, approach and uh, I mean, go beyond the compliance. I mean, why why any regulatory authority comes, visits your sites and I mean, give you notice for the control of the things. Instead, I mean, if uh, through a uh, aegis of say association like GAIHED or uh, uh, other uh, Gujarat civil engineers and uh, architects associations, if such voluntary mechanisms is prepared well, I mean, all the developers goes beyond compliance uh, uh, tag. And uh, there are now tools available. I mean, uh, you have a green building rating and perhaps it's a mandate under green building rating also to consider all these aspects. So my humble request is to, I mean, consider all small steps. I mean, when you land on a Delhi airport, you will find that construction is going on, but all the heaps of say, sands and gravels are covered with a net. And doctors have explained, uh, I mean, very illustrative examples and the best practices of, uh, uh, I mean, to control fugitive emissions in the large scale projects like applications of the mist guns and the curtains, water curtains and other things. Similar small approaches we can also adopt and uh, I mean, to control the fugitive emissions. And uh, it's not a rocket science. I mean, uh, solutions are simple. Only the thing is we need to inculcate habit and a mindset to implement it. So uh, thank you very much organizers to give us this opportunity to present as a regulator into this webinar for a very important aspect of uh, fugitive dust control. If I tell you about the source of postman studies of any cities, I mean developing cities, I mean it, it contributes third pie after industrial pollution uh, and uh, say transportation, construction and demolition waste comes third. I mean which contributes to uh, ambient air quality of our city. Okay, so that's why it's significant too. I mean no doubt it is being done into a scattered manner, so its cumulative effect is not that highlighted that it ought to be. But if you see it into terms of say quantum, say kg per day, it's quite high. And that's why it's a matter of concern for all. And I request all say stakeholders uh, involved into this to consider all these uh, minute micro steps to implement uh, and uh, to have even a sensor based approach. I mean, air quality measurements near the sites through a sensor base uh, now available at a low cost also. Uh, so as see if you will quantify your uh, emission load, then you will be able to do it mitigate properly. So I request you to implement all uh, such measures. Thank you very much once again, organizers of this webinars for inviting us to participate into this webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. It is very nice of you to have joined us. Uh, Mr. DM Tucker is the member secretary of Gujarat Pollution Control Board. And we are very, very happy and honored that you are here for this meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now over to Mr. Um, over to Mr. Nirat Shah. Yes. Uh, is, is my screen visible now? Yeah. So, you may make it in the presentation mode, that's all. Presentation mode, I'm going It is in presentation mode itself. No. Sir, he means to uh, make it full screen so that it is visible clearly. It is full okay. screen only. <laughs> it is visible here, but it is vis visible on the other side. Hello? No, sir, not yet. It is not in the full screen, I believe. Or your screen is hang. I mean, it's stuck somewhere. Uh, sorry, we are trying just one minute, please. Neeraj bhai, niche na portion ma je chhene TV je u batam chhene tyaathi karo. Ena pachi. One minute, dekho uh, na apko aap hai. The person who is sharing, I am telling her. Sure. Achha. हाँ एक करो एक करो हाँ 
Is it visible now? Yes, it is visible. It work. Okay. So no, no, go to the three dots. These three dots. Go to the three dots. Go to three dots and then. Then, uh, hmm. then hide presenter view. Hide presenter view. Uh. Ah, bus. Right. Bus, bus, bus. Uh. Okay. Is it visible now? No? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, once again, good morning, all. And with the kind words of my member secretary, uh, I will just go through my presentation, which uh, revolve around the pollution related aspects uh, associated with the construction activities. So basically, if we talk about pollution, in general, which rings to our mind is the industry or transportation. But as our member secretary said, uh, construction activity is also associated with the pollution. And uh, as per the source enforcement data, it is the third largest uh, you know, activity that adds to the pollution. So the construction activity is already a, one of the major source of pollution and is also responsible for considerable amount of particulate. <laughs> it is not only that uh, construction activity has got a, a air pollution potentiality in terms of uh, dusting and all other things. It also has a, you know, incidence of water pollution and noise pollution. Since our uh, today's uh, topic revolves around the construction and demolition waste and dusting uh, associated with that, I will not touch upon the water pollution issues and the noise pollution issue. But few, first few slides, what I am revolving around is only to just uh, flag an issue that it has got uh, some kind of uh, other pollution uh, issues also and the safety hazard also, which includes the accidents or the fall from high fire cuts. Next. The activities which contribute to air pollution mainly include, you know, land clearing activities, operation of the diesel engines, demolition activities, burning, construction and working with the toxic materials. A uh, high level of uh, dust is typically generated from the construction sites or from the concrete, cement, wood, stone, silica, like that. And uh, construction dust has already been known by everyone that it is PM 2.5 and PM 10 which is the particulate matter less than, uh, you know, micron size of 2.5 or 10 in diameter and is invisible to the naked eye. What uh, health issues associated with PM10 and PM2.5 is it penetrates deeply into the lungs and cause a wide range of health problem, including respiratory illnesses, asthma, bronchitis, and even cancer, if the uh, exposure is for the prolonged time. Uh, another major source for particulate matter 2.5 and 10 on the construction site is a diesel engine exhaust of vehicles and heavy equipment which are being used in abundant on a major site or almost on every construction site. And it is known as a diesel particulate matter and consists of shoot, sulfates and silicates, all of which readily combine with other toxins in the atmosphere and form, forms a secondary pollutant and increasing the health risk on the particle inhalation. Diesel is also responsible for emissions of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, nitrogen oxides, and carbon dioxide. So uh, diesel engine and use of diesel as a fuel in various vehicles also adds to the air pollution. And noxious vapor from oils, glues, thinners, paints, treated woods, plastic cleaners, and other hazardous chemicals that are very widely used on construction sites also contribute to the air pollution due to VOC. So with the construction activities, you know, uh, Air pollution consists of the dusting, then VOCs, then uh, other uh, air pollutants like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So all those things are also required to be, you know, controlled and looked at. If we once again come back to our original, you know, theme of today's uh, seminar, I would like to just go on the construction and demolition based uh, one overview on the topic, which probably everyone would be knowing, but still to reiterate construction and demolition waste means waste that comprising of the building materials, debris and rubble resulting from construction, remodeling, repair and demolition of any civil structure. So about 90% of the construction and demolition waste is either recyclable or a resource and can be used as a secondary resource. However, just we have uh, listened from an eminent speaker before uh, my presentation that uh, agencies available for recycling is not uh, readily available but still it has got the potential of uh, recycling of, from the construction and demolition waste. What is the legal provision? Legal provision lays down, you know, very clear cut uh, mandate for every stakeholder, but just to brief about to whom it is going to be applicable for the generator, 
it talks that uh, any waste generator who generate more than 20 tons or more in one day or 300 tons per project in a month has to comply with the provisions of the construction and demolition waste management rule 2016. Uh, activities which generate construction and demolition waste in cities or towns are mainly from you know demolition of the existing or old dilapidated structures, renovation of the existing buildings, construction of new buildings, excavation and reconstruction of asphalt concrete roads, construction of new flyover bridges, center bridges, subways, etc. Renovation, installation of new water, telephone, internet, sewer pipeline, etc. This is uh, just an indicative list. There are many other activities which are going on in uh, uh, today's developing uh, you know, era. And uh, all of the activities has got some kind of uh, uh, pollution potentiality and some effect on the docile environment. Now, the different types of uh, construction activity uh, that includes uh, residential buildings, institutional and commercial buildings, specialized industrial construction, infrastructure and heavy construction. These are the wide, you know, categories of the construction activities which are going on. Whereas the demolition activities which are either dry or wet, if we club it in a sector type or, you know, a specific uh, uh, header, then it would be a interior demolition, which actually is a limited application and is uh, for the uh, demolition of the interior structure only. Selective demolition and dismantling, that is for the removal of the specific interior or exterior portions and not the whole structure. Mechanical demolition is the demolition using specialized mechanical equipment and tools and hydraulic uh, machines and all other things. And implosion, which we have just uh, have listened to a whole uh, presentation on this technique, which is a demolition through use of explosives. Now, processes in a demolition activity, which has got the chances of generation of particulate matter 2.5 and 10 generation. First is the explosion for an unused selection of a section of a building or for the whole structure. We have just learned a demolition of, through explosion for the whole structure in Noida. Then the second methodology that is generally adopted is a cutting and hammering for internal demolition of or control task of retrofitting. The crushing that is used for, as a, for the larger boulder into a mechanized crusher. Drilling activity is a cutting larger section into a smaller ones transportation and the transfer of the materials internal or outside. So these are the processes, previous, previous one. So these are the processes which are adopted uh, individually or collectively in the activity, the demolition activities. Next. Uh, now coming back to a small, uh, as our member secretary has said, it is not a rocket science that one has to go for the control of the dust uh, control. But it is all about, you know, uh, mindset, then uh, planning and cultivating a culture amongst the workmen and workforce. So as uh, for the noise pollution, we have a, a practice that we generate, a, create a silent zone and put a board so that uh, people are aware that we don't have to blow horn in this area. We don't have to make noise in this area because the hospital is there or school is there. In a similar fashion, we can also can identify that this is an area where the high dust generation potentiality is there. And therefore, some kind of a personal protective equipment is to be there while going into that and other uh, 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 corrective actions may be taken. As already said, the normal sheet cover, maybe a green sheet cover, maybe a, a waiting can be done for the green sheet. And the daily or regular spraying of the treated wastewater or a fresh water over the accumulated material responsible for dust generation at the site can also be uh, deployed for the control of the dusting spray gun which we have already seen in the previous uh, you know presentation how it can be very effectively used then the loading and unloading points basically all transfer points are the major source of a dust generation so usually it is a loading and unloading point which have to be you know uh, taken extra precautions and extra care and we have to ensure that uh, loading and unloading points should be as minimum as possible and uh, uh, all the necessary uh, control measures can be deployed at those loading and unloading points. The roads to also require to be regularly sprayed with the water sprinklers. But we have to take care that we don't uh, excessively water that particular area and it should be just enough so that uh, dust does not uh, resuspend or uh, it does not uh, result into a uh, carryover in the ambient air and create a problem. 
if possible the paving of the road should also be done mechanized sweeping machine can also be deployed depending upon the type of the you know uh, size of the project and uh, approach roads where vehicles are moving and coming to the side should also be adequately paved and its maintenance should also be given enough importance specifically we also have to look at you know the surroundings of the site if the site is uh, amidst the you know residential area then you have to take a extra precautions if it is in the isolated area though you need to take a precautions but you may not compare you know a sensitive area with the open area so you also need to take a view about your location of the site and the surrounding area if possible uh, treated domestic waste water from the concerned authority shall be used for the dust separation because as we know that you know water is also a very precious commodity and we cannot uh, afford to lose fresh water as far as possible therefore you know a treated domestic waste water from the concerned authority shall be preferably used for the dust separation next wind breaking wall on the periphery of the adequate ice for the barricade is also to be provided usually we have a tendency to look at the you know a prevailing wind direction we put a wind breaking wall only on the one side but as already said that in a china you know uh, they cover from all the four sides and if required that is also you know sprinkled with the water so that it creates a wind uh, weight uh, uh, wall for barricading the transfer of the dusting from the side so that can also be deployed no industrial waste to be mixed with the concrete waste for the treatment sometimes you know people have a tendency to use a industrial waste to be waste with the concrete waste for the treatment sometimes we have also seen that uh, some of the chemical which has got the hygroscopic uh, nature is, is used for uh, you know wetting the ground so that you know uh, you don't uh, frequency of uh, spraying of the water reduces so that can also not be adopted for an example uh, some people try to use a calcium chloride to be sprayed on a uh, land so that this being a hydroscopic material it uh, remains wet for a longer period of time but it is again uh, causing a soil pollution related issue so unloading site shall be inspected for remaining waste material and pro uh, through professional with ppa and shall be given task to clean the unloading site to reduce amount of fugitive emissions from unloading vehicles usually unloading sites are you know left unattended if some kind of a monitoring through the professional is uh, you know given that importance then probably in a scientific engineering way it can be handled and it will not uh, result into a source of uh, suspension of the dust and uh, specific care should be given to those sites another source of uh, generation of the dusting is a cutting of plaster or the wall for plumbing and electrification so we can do a, some kind of a you know waiting with this thing as if you know in a dental treatment when they use a uh, that driller the purpose in dental treatment is to keep uh, uh, that driller machine cool but here also we can definitely use some kind of a methodology to wait that area so that it doesn't get uh, suspended or suspension is there then dusting can be controlled we can also think at the planning stage itself about the limit the number of cuts and the drilling so that unnecessarily we don't have to drill higher uh, length of a cuts and drills we can also reduce the duration of the operations so that you know the time period for which it gets suspended can be reduced and the travel of the dust can be controlled we can also collectively try to use the vacuum machine along with the drilling machine so that it is just like a exhaust machine which we use in our you know uh, bathrooms or in the kitchen so that that particular area remains uh, clean in a similar fashion we can uh, try to deploy the vacuum machine along with the drilling and uh, cutting machine so that whatever dust is generated is directly sucked into the machine and it will not be there in a ambient environment storage of the construction material in a enclosed area and properly covered it cannot be you know kept unattended and kept uh, just uh, in one corner of the site next uh usually big uh, sites uh, have their uh, ready mix concrete plant at the site itself by default it is always provided with the inbuilt air pollution control measure but you know whatever we have seen so far and what we have experienced is you know its regular and efficient operation is not there so what is important is you know somebody should be made accountable uh, uh, on the site itself who will monitor that uh, air pollution control measures provided with the ready mix concrete or some other thing 
is really used regularly and efficiently and it is not a mere you know provision otherwise it will not serve the purpose uh, another thing which is very common is a uh, you know a free loose material dumping of the material from the hive so basically uh, we should not uh, have a, this kind of a practice to throw the material from the hive along with its uh, you know uh, risk for the worker working on the ground it has also got the potentiality of uh, you know having a higher dust generation so we can also think of uh, provisions of the shoots so that whatever material is generated on the higher floors can directly be you know uh, transported on the ground with safety and with the control of uh, this dusting potentiality uh, washing of the vehicles and equipment in designated area can also be deployed and wash water what is be should be used for the treated uh, water and it can be reused within the plant for the separation of the dust so that you know dusting that is a uh, dust that is attached with the tires of the vehicles when we that vehicles goes out it again does not uh, resuspend and give the dusting problem to the surrounding area next so and the transportation of the material that is to be done should always be ensured that it is covered properly irrespective of the mode of transport and we can also think of uh, at the planning stage itself to reduce the number of trips as far as possible for its uh, optimum utilization so that you know number of trips can also be reduced we can also think of uh, limiting the speed so that you know the suspension of the dust or resuspension of the dust or creation of the dust can also be reduced its uh, travel distance can be reduced and uh, it should also be ensured that vehicles which are used for the transportation of the vehicle uh, material are in a good condition we can definitely think of having a growing a trees at the periphery because the plantation minimizes propagation of the noise and also arrests the dust which is which is known to everyone dg sets are inevitable at such sites and uh, use of dg sets should be compliant with the rules and we can also experiment on the large site or the developing area of the smoke towers next we can also deploy some engineering controls with all motorized equipment such as lift conveyor belts and concrete mixtures and this controls includes ventilation system with scrubber or at least an area uh, air replacement fan enclosures like that if possible looking at the you know size of the project we can also it will not only add to the aesthetics but will also uh, be in a position to control the travel of the dust through water fountains water bodies or landscape and area where possible and plantation as i already spoke that it will help to reduce fugitive emissions and noise control we can also think of using a low sulfur diesel oil in all vehicles and equipment engines and incorporate the latest specifications of particular filters and catalytic converter so that those machines and dg set will not add to the air pollution sometimes the common practice which is adopted for the disposal of the material is a open burning so it should not be burned and it should be disposed of as per the provisions of the law whether it falls under construction and demolition or municipal solid waste so accordingly it can be segregated it can be stored separately and then uh, should be disposed of we can also think of having a clean up with the vacuum instead of a broom and avoid use of compressed air gun wherever possible we can also think of engineering options available by managing dust with the elimination and use of casting method can be adopted next then after having all these things what is important is as already said it's a training and uh, creating awareness uh, through the persons who are really working on the ground because you know all these things becomes uh, uh, decided in the office by the planners and with the contractors and but ultimately who is going to adopt all these things it is a ground work with the managers or the contractors or the site uh, engineer so one should definitely have a you know training and awareness program before start of the construction activity with the review system so we can impart knowledge covering all the aspect that is the knowledge of uh, machinery is being used procedure for reporting emergencies location and use of the fire fighting equipments knowledge of alarm system training in first aid you know we can also provide the pro protective gear like for dust and noise google um, goggles and helmets and face shield hand gloves first aid facilities so all these good practices will you know help control and prevent pollution 
what uh, the good construction site practice what we can talk about is the we can definitely prepare a environment risk assessment plan at the initial step only before we go for the construction activities and materials are likely to cause pollution so we consider you know at the planning stage itself we can definitely think of uh, what construction activities and materials we are going to use and what are the associated pollution potentiality and accordingly risk assessment uh, can be done and we can plan in advance so and also suggest the specific measure that can be taken to mitigate this risk usually the dumping of waste whatever waste are generated at the site what we have a common practice knowingly or unknowingly is a disposing the cough in the open or a landfilling one in a low lying area but that should be avoided and it should go for the recycling or the reprocessing site uh, as mandated under the construction and demolition waste rule and uh, as uh, sir has rightly said that monitoring concept to be developed so we can definitely have a sensor based uh, monitoring facilities at the periphery or at the important points of the site so that we can come to know that what we are contributing to the air pollution and whatever you know risk assessment uh, whatever mitigative measures we have adopted is adequate enough or not whether it serves the purpose or not unless we monitor the you know uh, our input to the ambient environment we won't be in a position to judge whether we are adding or we are in a uh, right state next so i think these are the very common practices as we said that it is not a rocket science probably most of the contractors are adopting this thing but you know instead of you know adequate number of uh, control uh, steps are also equally re uh, required because mere one or two or three steps at two, two or three locations will also not serve the purpose so finally you know assessing our site material associated risk and the mitigative measures adequate numbers of mitigative measures its regular operations and monitoring is the key for control of the dust uh, suspension with this i thank you very much for providing us uh, an opportunity to share our views on the topic thank you thank you thank you thank you mr um, uh, nirash shah for your very nice presentation and um, letting us know about the main concern of air pollution during construction and demolition uh, i will not talk too much because of short of time we have already exceeded but we will take at least about 5 minutes and ask um, for any questions if there are maybe we can take couple of questions uh, before we conclude <clears throat> So there is a question from Mr. Maheshwar Reddy. He says that now the whole world is moving towards electric vehicles. Great things, but I have a few thoughts. I think it should be which are blocks on my mind. What is the CO2 footprint for battery manufacturing? I think you know. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Maheshwar Reddy. I think we should uh, try to restrict our questions to the topic uh, of uh, construction-related pollution and. Uh, Uh, demolition related pollution rather than this so i'm sorry about that i don't know whether anybody is um, uh, having knowledge and talking about this particular topic what you're talking about the uh, vehicle pollution or is it are you addressing it to any specific person there is another question i will take in the meantime how to estimate the amount of uh, construction and demolition waste generated in the city per day is there any standard on amount of cnd waste generated per square feet of building uh, probably this question could be answered by mr neeraj shah uh you know uh, there is no specific limit but i think there is a thumb rule about the generation of the waste per square meter it is you know in a demolition activities it is 10 times higher than the you know uh, waste that is going to be generated uh, during the construction activities it is somewhere around 450 kg per uh, square meter like so you know it is a thumb rule that has been uh, devised out of uh, one study that has been carried out uh, in surat so uh, construction and demolition waste that is generated during the construction activity is quite less than the demolition activities it is 10 times than the construction activity thank you so there is another question from mr navin kumar uh, demolition of complete building is done from top to bottom or bottom to top or from one side to other so this first thing question should be answered well by mohan ramanathan <coughs> 
Yeah, there's no particular rule as to go from top down or bottom up. Uh, it depends on the situation. Normally in small buildings, uh, less than 10 stories, uh, it's usually from top down. We start demolition from the topmost floor and then go down scientifically, that's the correct way. But you will see in places like Mumbai and uh, other places where people who do shortcut methods, they would just come and uh, demolish the columns and then uh, quickly retract the excavator and then it's high risk, it will fall down. So the, if you ask, uh, if you look at the, what is the correct method, it's usually top down, uh, uh, except for implosion. For implosion, we, we implode the bottom columns first and go up, but it's a matter of few seconds. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is on uh, Mr. M.K. Singh. Question on how uh, IGBC can help in recycling of the construction and demolition waste. So Mr. Samir Sina probably can uh, answer this question. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And there's a there's a lot to be done in that arena, actually. Um, as uh, Mohan was saying, we do not have any large plants that are available in the city uh, or in, in India where we can recycle some of this waste. But uh, probably what I can add to this, AMC has done some wonderful job of uh, converting uh, uh, construction, seeded construction demolition waste into paper blocks. Uh, uh -huh. And those are the kind of initiatives that, uh, that needs to be uh, really propagated throughout the country. Every municipal corporation must do something like this. Uh, because these are like, like projects which can only be taken at a city level. Uh, the waste must be uh, the responsibility of the developer to be brought to a central location and then must be recycled uh, into uh, blocks which can be reused in construction. So there's a lot of things that needs to be done, but a large topic which can be discussed in a separate issue. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely. In fact, uh, in case of road construction, now slowly the government is making it mandatory to use recycled asphalt in all the plants. So, you know, we are, um, uh, in, in, of course, it cannot be done on a greenfield project because there is no existing road. So only in case of reconstruction, relaying and all, the government is insisting that you do. So we have plants which can recycle up to 60% of uh, uh, asphalt uh, can be recycled. Asphalt material, what we take out. And first of such plant has been supplied to us, so supplied by us to GR Infra. The plant is already commissioned. In fact, in Europe, they go up to even 100% of recycling of the uh, asphalt roads. So there are techniques, technologies available which can be done. I will take only I a couple of more to, questions. Just to add to that, just yeah. to add to your point, I think we have a huge advantage in India that we already have a very good recycling philosophy. Uh, yeah. If you look at any uh, housing, uh, any, any demolition of bungalows, for example, it gets properly recycled to a very, very large extent. The, the windows and doors are recycled. The steel is recycled. Uh, so now it's only the responsibility uh, it remains with the, with the city or with large plants to recycle the construction, the concrete waste, which is much easier because it's already segregated. It's yeah. complex to, to uh, recycle uh, mixed waste, but if it is already segregated, it becomes so much easier and so much simpler to do that. Right. And we as a country Anand, already have Anand. a job. Yeah, Mohan. Yes, Mohan. Anand. So uh, uh, I've been promoting CND waste recycling wherever possible. And uh, I think we have got the rules in 2016. We have changed the IS code for, ag for aggregates. Uh, IS383 has been modified. And we allow 25% of the recycled concrete aggregates to be yeah. used in regular concrete. It's going to be increased to 40% now, but there are no takers. Right. The consultants uh, who are the guys who have to promote this are not doing it. The owners want to look away. So the provisions have been made, uh, but there is no incentive. Uh, you, uh, GST must go out of this, like they do in many countries, including UK. There's no VAT on recycled aggregates. Uh, this has to come. And I'm not sure how many, and IGBC can do a lot. And uh, if I want to recycle a building uh, material like from Noida, I have no incentive from IGBC to go ahead and do this. So the contractor has to bear the entire cost. So he will say, why should I do it? Where is the incentive for me to do it? So IGBC should step in because it's a green activity for recycling. So all these authorities 
must come together and, and the urban ministry has done their part, but we are not doing our part. That's my comment. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, there are so many questions. I don't know whether we have the time. In fact, I should take the blame. Shubham was uh, uh, asking me to do the program for two hours. I, I cut it down to 90 minutes. But if uh, people are interested, we can take, we can spend another five minutes. So uh, I will ask a couple of more questions. And maybe these questions can be sent to the respective people so that they can answer and uh, we will communicate it to the people. I think, uh, having said that, I think now the, the, some idea is coming to me that we should have a separate topic on recycling and we should have a separate topic on green building. Or maybe combine this and make one more seminar in the coming days. Uh, that will be really very, very interesting, I think. So anyway, coming back to this, uh, there is a question from Mr. Uh, Jalwa. Mohan, sir, in what way shall we utilize the demolition waste? Okay, it's the same, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what kind of guidelines does the CND dust uh, remission follows? Is it okay to follow guidance assessment of the dust demolition and construction? I don't know who could answer this question. No, there are rules. I think uh, uh, Mr. Neeraj Shah can answer. There are rules in place already for this. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not continuously monitoring is not happening in India. Uh, the, the dust control in construction sites is not happening. At one point of time, I think Delhi stopped all construction because of the high dust. Mm -hmm. uh, so this kind of things, uh, there are rules in place. That's the answer. Right. So one last anonymous uh, uh, question. This I will take, sir. This is a question for Dr. Vatsal Patel. Uh, address in India, a lot of demolition and old structures being progress, but as per the best vision is concerned, this is the major difference I have seen between India and abroad. In Mumbai, they believe in conservation, where the buildings older than 70 to 80 years are still functional, whereas in India, it is not the case. So, can't we work on in such a way that where we look to build for a longer span of time? So, Dr. Dr. Vatsal Padel. Uh, yes, the point is right, but uh, as far as uh, residential and commercial buildings is concerned, uh, there's few different type of buildings. Suppose it's a heritage building, then definitely we should uh, maintain it and uh, we should keep it uh, as our uh, heritage. But when it is the building like a chawl buildings or uh, apartments, which is already 50 years old, uh, store buildings and lots of safety concern is there and lots of people acquire their buildings. In such, situation, in such situations, we should uh, uh, go for the demolition or redevelopment. And of course, with the new concrete technology nowadays, good quality of buildings uh, coming up and the life of the new buildings is definitely more than what it was in older time because the quality of steel is also improving, the quality of concrete is also improving. So definitely in, uh, in future, these demolitions will go into less. So ultimately, we will increase the life of our building. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will stop here because of the paucity of time. We have far exceeded the limit. So uh, I would now propose a most of thanks. I think it was a fantastic uh, seminar, both uh, presented by Mr. Mohan Ramanathan and uh, Mr. Neeraj Shah. Um, Thank you very much for your presence and also your presentation. Uh, the presence of um, Mr. D.M. Tucker, Member Secretary, Gujarat Pollution Control Board was an icing on the cake. Thank you very much for attending the seminar. Of course, I would also like to take uh, a thank to Mr. Samir uh, Sinha, Dr. Vatsal Patel for their presence here. Definitely, we have to do a separate seminar on uh, IGBC and also on, uh, uh, you know, architects as involved. It's not only IGBC. I would also like to talk about BIM, which is again not recommended by the uh, architect community. You know, when we do a new project or something, nobody talks about BIM, nobody talks about IGBC. So we have to do something with the architect fraternity to, you know, uh, talk on these subjects. It depends to it, uh, it is left to the owner whether he wants to use it or not. But at least we should bring this forward. So we will have a separate seminar on that um, coming in one of these coming days. So I thank all of you. I also thank all the participants. I thank uh, Shubham for taking this uh, through and also all the CIA secretariats who have made this uh, 
uh, the seminar a real grand success. I wish that we had given more time for the seminar. I think one and a half hours was not enough. Maybe it should have been at least two hours so that uh, we could have given full justice to the seminar. So thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you for all the participants. We had uh, more than 300 uh, registration. <clears throat> and this is also added in the, in the media. So we had about 85, 86 participants directly present. But I'm sure that many people have also seen that through uh, when we have aired it. So thank you once again. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you, Mr. Samishana. Thank you, Dr. Vatsal Patel. Thank you, Mr. Neeraj Shah. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.